Hello, I'm Doug Musio. The CUNY TV Democratic primary election special that you are about to view is being brought to you as a public service by the City University of New York. In the last few days, I recorded one-on-one 15-minute interviews with each of the Democratic mayoral candidates, Alan Hevesy, Peter Vallone, Mark Green, and Fernando Ferrer. The interviews were standardized for all the candidates. You can see this program again today at 2 p.m. and 10 p.m., Saturday at 4 p.m. and 11 p.m., Sunday at noon and 11 p.m., and finally, Monday at midnight. CUNY urges you to go to the polls on September 11th and vote. The polls are open from 6 a.m. until 9 p.m. Remember, exercise your right to vote. Make your voice heard. Mr. Hevesy, welcome to CUNY TV. Thank you very much. Why you? Why not Freddie Ferrer, Mark Green, or Peter Vallone as the next mayor of New York City? Well, first of all, they're my friends, and they all bring uh, considerable qualifications to the table. Let's, let's okay. agree to that. But I think the mayor's job is such a big job that it requires someone uh, with a wide range of talents and experiences and successes that go beyond the records of my uh, friends and opponents. Uh, let me give you an example. Got to be a policymaker. Got to know how to make law. Mm -hmm. Peter Vallone, Speaker of the Council, right. he knows how. And I have 22 years in the New York Assembly, author of 108 laws, some of which have saved lives, been involved in every major uh, legislative and social and political and civil rights issue imaginable. I voted 50,000 times, by the way, committee and on the floor over, over the years. But you got to be more than that. You got to be a manager. It's an operation right now that has 253,000 employees. Mm -hmm. It's a huge management uh, responsibility. I'm a manager. Uh, for example, Peter Vallone has never managed any agency. My 800 member agency is very sophisticated, very technical controller's office. But we are, more than that, the manager of the managers. Mm -hmm. We audit every city agency. We did the Y2K audits for two years to make sure there was no problem in every single computer system in this city. You have to be um, understand we're the center of the global economy. I'm the representative of the city in the global economy. None of my uh, uh, friends have any kind of experience there. We do the end deals. And I have Sheila Sisulu of South Africa in my office talking about how we do international trade. Um, uh, you have to be a fiscal expert. Under the charter, that's who I am. I'm the fiscal monitor, particularly with the economy going south. So you've got it all. Let me finish the okay, thought because there's two more pieces go to it. Education is the number one new issue, a massive reform of the public schools. I'm a teacher. I have the PhD. I've been in a classroom, uh, Queens College, for 27 years. Now Columbia, uh, as an adjunct, you know, one course. Mm -hmm. And um, I have the best uh, plan for school reform, public school reform. That's why I've been endorsed by the United Federation of Teachers. And finally, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the mayor has to have a very good relationship, not a hostile relationship, with the people who control us, and that's the state government, the governor and the mayor, the, legis the governor and the legislative leaders. Mm -hmm. I'm close friends with the leaders in the assembly. I have good relations with the Senate, Republicans. And I can call George Pataki, as I did on Route 120, the widening of Route 120 in Westchester. Why is that relevant? Route 120 is a two-lane road. They wanted to make it a four-lane road. It rides four inches next to and over the Kensico Reservoir. The Kensico Reservoir is a filter reservoir. Fifteen reservoirs filter their water into the Kensico through 6,000 miles of pipes to your uh, faucet. Mm -hmm. And if the widening of the lane increases truck traffic, pollution, uh, construction of uh, office buildings on the other side of the road into the water, we will have to filter our water for $8 billion. I called up uh, the governor, who's an old friend from the legislature, George, this is not a great idea. Please take a look at it. We'll send you the materials. Two months later, he killed the deal. Un uh, unlike Rudy Giuliani, for example, uh, who could not stop the legislature from repealing the commuter tax. I believe if, if I were the mayor or any of the Democrats were the mayor, we would not have repealed the commuter tax. We'd have found another way to deal with the suburban politics than, than to hurt us for $500 million a year. That okay. was a long-winded answer. Okay. Forgive me. We'll take it. That's, that's the longest one. 
Talk to me about a defining political moment, a situation, an event, or an act that has influenced the direction of your public life. Well, there's an initial uh, uh, epiphany, if you will, about how wonderful this life could be and how important when I saw John Kennedy at Sunnyside Garden in 1960. But I think the most significant, uh, more recent um, uh, event was the invitation by Edgar Bronfman to come to lunch and discussed Holocaust restitution. And from that flowed a role that I played and Al D'Amato played. Mm -hmm. He was the bad cop, I was the good right. cop. End result, uh, I mean, I organized 900 financial officers that after two years of failed negotiations threatened an international trade war, and I'm the one announcing the sanctions. And we have Switzerland, France, Germany, uh, the Netherlands, Austria, Norway, we're working on Poland, have already made restitution, not only financial, but a historical commissions in each country to, to uh, make clear to the population the culpability of those nations. I thought that was a pretty significant moment. Thank you. What's your biggest hands-on victory in New York City or New York State politics where you rolled up your sleeves and got your hands around the problem? Well, uh, if we're not talking about the restitution in right. New York, the mayor proposed before the Wall Street boom the sale of the watershed all 19 reservoirs, all 6,000 miles of pipes in an area the size of the state of Rhode Island to the state of New York for cash flow. Um, he got the council, Speaker Vallone, to pass it into law. I refused to do the bond deal. It was an awful idea. It was dumb environmentally. It would have meant we don't control, the, the, the regulate the purity mm -hmm. and quality of our water, which we have to do with 100 decisions a week, every week forever. It was a financial disaster because if I sell you my car, I have an expectation you'll pay for it. I was selling you my watershed. You were in New York State. Right. You weren't paying for it. We right. were paying for it. The water and sewer rate payers. It was t awful, terrible. I ultimately, it took four months, but I ultimately said, no, we're not doing this deal. The mayor sued me, and I won on all three levels of court up to the Court of Appeals, 13 judges all unanimously. Okay. Let's take a tour. Let's go through the five boroughs. Point out what you've accomplished. What can you point out and say, this is here because of Alan Hevesy? Uh, I can't differentiate as to the character of what we've accomplished because uh, we, we do general programs that have an effect in every uh, borough. For example, um, I, I have created, I didn't create, I have sustained and grown a program called Economically Targeted Investments. The theory of, of, of uh, pension management for most of America is you invest in equities and real estate, whatever you invest in, get the biggest return for the, for the, with the smallest risk. It's not your money. What bor I mean, we're taking a tour of the boroughs. Uh, the, the, and that you can point to the, some kind of housing rehabilitation, okay. 10,770 units of housing rehab under this economically targeted investment program in every borough. Okay. That's what we wanted to hear. This campaign, is there anything happened or has everything happened that you haven't expected? What has surprised you about this campaign? The, what, looking back, really almost shocks you? The smear by the mayor. The intrusion by Mayor Giuliani into a Democratic primary because he doesn't want me to win and his willingness to lie every single day and to smear me every single day. Total lies, general, generalizations. He's very good at it, but he's a liar. Has he given you a break here? Has he given you an opportunity to make yourself different from the other Democrats? Has he done you a favor? No, he's not done me any favor. I uh, mean, strategically, politically, no, not personally. No, he hasn't because I have to overcome the barrier that there may be one person in a thousand who believes him because they like that he's cleaned up crime. I give him credit for what he's done, but he's a chronic liar and uh, he's, a, he's a vicious person. And he hasn't done this to me alone. I mean, I'm a you know, line up. A lot of people have been uh, victims. He's, he's destroyed careers, uh, and he'll say anything and do anything. He's a bad guy. Anything else that surprised you other than the reaction of the mayor, which to a certain extent wasn't that surprising? Yeah, no, on the other side of the coin, the fact that the campaign among the four Democrats has been as dignified and substantive and genteel as it has, it's that's sort of surprising. It's been remarkably civil. Yeah, well, we're for, there's a, a, a number of dynamics. One is there's no great issue that rips us apart. Right. Uh, there's no incumbent or anybody who's big because they're not the incumbent. Mm -hmm. You have four friends running. We agree on most issues. And there's a runoff. So you don't want to offend your friend whose support you might want when you get into the runoff. So you add that all up. But mostly it's good intentions on the part of the candidates. Everybody is tough. 
These guys are tough. Well, They're well, willing to mix it up, but never cross a line. And, that's, and, and I'm particularly gratified, if I may, because I don't think I'm obsessed by being attacked by the mayor, but that's <laughs> today's obsession. I understand. But the reality is they've, uh, well, Mark Green less so, but the others have, uh, Peter Vallone and, and Freddie Ferrer, have been very gracious in support of my reputation and integrity. <laughs> What's the story with endorsements? I mean, do they, do they really matter? What, yeah. what, you know, what do they matter? They've, how so and how much? If you've got candidates who are not fully defined for the voters, we're new candidates. We may be in around a, a while, but we had low name recognition, sure. and none of us are giants and, and won't some be. Of you still have low name recognition. Yeah. That's one of the surprising and, things. And we shouldn't be compared, for example, with Rudy Giuliani or with uh, Mario Cuomo or the, the great names, because they were... Uh, lesser well-known figures until they got elected. Sure. Um, so you go out and you tell your story and you give your record, uh, but it has to be validated. You have to. The voters get a validation. Okay. So when I when Mark Green goes to the African American community and says David Dinkins is for me, uh, okay. Okay. And now and the African American community is very much divided. Sure. So Freddie Ferrer does it with Al Sharpton and sure. Charlie Rangel. Sure. Sure. I have 17 elected officials who are African American. I'll you know uh, Major Owens and Floyd Flake and Clarence Norman and a whole. So so that validation counts. And okay. when you add on to that, uh, you know the New York Times or labor unions or so on, uh, it makes. So a in addition, but in addition to legitimation or validation. I'm We've got to calculate this in some way in terms of votes. What endorsements turn out the votes? You mentioned the New York, the New York Times. Times. To a certain extent, that's the last card out there. And the the rest of the cards have been played except for 1199 and the Times. And it looks like 1199 isn't going to play that I card. I believe that's true. The Times is out there. The thought was initially that the Times wanted to give the endorsement to mm. one Alan Hevesy. But one Alan Hevesy... Made a mistake, if you will, in terms of the campaign finance board, and then Alan Hevesy may disagree with that. But let's say he does. Did, did he? Did he ruin his opportunity? Did he blow it? Times? Did he blow it? Here's what's beautiful about the New York Times, and the editorial board and their leadership is, they're not going to react like this to an event until they have worked their way through it. Mm -hmm. And I think they're working their way through this. And they come to an understanding, let me tell you. Yeah, we had a conflict with the F campaign finance board, and my consultant uh, got into a fight with a priest. Not a great idea. <laughs> Is that uh, the next day I announced, and he said, we're going to sue. Sure. By the way, because there's one issue that separates us. Not all the spinning by my opponents about all the, uh, you know, they came down to one issue. The other, the other methods we used for expending our money to save our money, all were validated right. by the campaign right. finance board. Right. The one issue is, could he be a volunteer? Right. And under law, we believe we're right. Okay. They believe they're right. We could afford it and gone to court, and I announced we're not going to do that. But and the end result for the New York Times and everybody else is no fine, no penalty, no, uh, you know, no sanction. And return of a, or the, the the restoration of all our matching funds. You don't get end the, the stories. You don't get the Times endorsement. Can you make the runoff? Uh, yes, it's just harder. Sure. Okay. Absolutely. Why not? Okay. Um, I mean, I've endorsed by 23 unions representing 450,000 people. This, this uh, communication workers, the Public Employees Federation, the fire offices, the firefighters, the United Federation of Teachers. It's one of the biggest. Uh, you talked about big endorsements. That's a big endorsement. Uh, DC 37. Um, 1199, the teachers are the big, biggest unions. DC 37 uh, endorsed Peter Vallone, although half a, in the half a percent below uh, 50 percent um, endorsed someone all, sure. over neutral. Uh, 1199 has not endorsed anyone. They right. probably will stay out of it. Why are they and, staying out? Because they have too many friends among the candidates. And you and wait for the runoff, or does, do they I sit out of the runoff? To, talk to them. Of the talk to okay, them. I, I will. I, I will. I'll probably be getting to the runoff. Who knows? And the UFT is almost unanimous for me. So those are big endorsements. Uh, do, do they make a difference. Who gets out the vote? Where's your field operations? Uh, um, so um, it, it, it's, you can, can you win without a particular endorsement? Sure. sure. Uh, is it easier with it? Yes. Obviously. TV characters and movie characters. Rudy Giuliani. What TV or movie character, past or present, does Rudy Giuliani remind you of? Oh, it's so difficult because you can have a heroic uh, gunfighter on one side cleaning up uh, the town, and then you have a... <laughs> what, is your, what is your image? Is it Paladin or something else? Well, I had Paladin in mind, 
Um, but it's a paladin who is very unethical and uh, doesn't tell the truth and uh, really uh, works the system. Uh, let me summarize it uh, by a quote I used in this recent uh, um, uh, dispute, that prosecutor Rudy Giuliani would have never tolerated what Mayor Giuliani has done. Thank you. So I don't know what TV character matches that. Okay. Is there any Alan Hevesy TV? Who's the TV character that Alan Hevesy is? I don't Take away the image of the New York Post front page today. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. Thank you. My Very pleasure. informative. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Good to see you. If you took away a star for every one million people who didn't vote, and a stripe for every five million non voters, and a patch of blue for the 10 million people who didn't care. Exactly what kind of flag are we waving? Mr. Vallone, yeah. welcome to CUNY TV. It's nice to be back. Why you as mayor? Why not Freddie Ferrer, Mark Green, or Alan Hevesy? What do you bring to the table? Well, they're all very nice guys. But, you know, this is a little bit different than any other election. Uh, everybody in government, as you know them, are gone. Um, there won't even be staff on, on the uh, city council side of the mm -hmm. world. Uh, who's the only one of the candidates that actually governs in City Hall? I just came back <laughs> from City Hall. I just had a meeting with the mayor. I have meetings with the mayor, meetings with the chancellor. We have a crisis in public school coming up. I have a clinic access bill. I, I have things that are very controversial. That's what a mayor has to do. And I've done that, and I do it every day. You're not taking any chance with me. That's the real difference between me and the other candidates. They're talking about what they would like to do, but they can't tell you what they've done in City Hall because they haven't done anything in City Hall. So I bring the experience and a vision. I mean, I really can do things as mayor. Uh, in CUNY, one of the greatest things that we've done, and, and remember the mayor vetoed it, was any kid in any mm -hmm. place in the city of New York, from any school, public or private, who graduates with a B average or better, we are now reducing your tuition in half if you come to this great university. Right, right. They said, when I proposed this two years, it can't be done. We can't afford it. Uh, the mayor will never allow it. The uh, people never vote for it. And you're not, you don't have enough money to do it. So we it's got 25,000 kids that are doing it right now. So you're telling me it's not only experience, but it's can-do experience. Exactly. Okay. Tell me about a defining political moment, a, dis a situation, an event, or act that has sort of defined your public life. Ed Gatt says, was the moment that I was elected was the most exciting <laughs> event in history. I was elected by the overwhelming plurality of one vote. Yeah, but you're, yeah, but, <laughs> right. It was really a defining moment for okay. me. Be because everyone expected me to, to uh, lop off the heads of the people that voted against me sure. and, you know, do what any other body, any other person in politics or government up until that time would have done. Mm -hmm. Reward your friends, you know, punish them. And I did just the opposite. The moment that I was elected, I said, we're not making any decisions. We're going to take two weeks. And I brought everybody in, all staff. I, I don't care where you came from. My only point, I want you to do the best you can in what you're doing. And if you don't make mistakes, you can't work for me. But, you know, we learn by our mistakes. And it was a new, um, a new breath of fresh air. And, and, you know, my best friends today are people who vote against me. I mean, you know, Victor Robles, who was my, my, he's like all over the place with me. And, and he was one of the votes against me at the time. Herb Berman was a good friend sure. of mine, you know, with the control. Sure. And, and I think it's one of the reasons why for the last 12 years the council has been free of racism. It's been free of the ugliness that you see in Albany mm -hmm. and sometimes that you see in Washington. Uh, we get along even though we have uh, disagreements. Well, just parenthetically, I was the chief of staff for a city councilman on, under the previous ruler of the council, and, and the tone and tenor of the council has certainly been much right. more democratic, if you will. Well, you uh, remember those you days? Can, those I are, remember those, those days. Those are the days when, who did you call? You called the county leader when you wanted to vote. Well, we didn't get the agenda to the, of the meeting until the day after the meeting <laughs> occurred. What's your biggest hands-on victory, where you rolled up your sleeves, got your hands on a problem and tackled it and resolved it. During the uh, Dinkins administration, and Dave and I were good friends, um, um, you know, this city was, was going to pot. And as soon as we got the power, as soon as I got the power, and I was elected speaker and, and the charter revision kicked in, uh, the first thing I did is I went to the mayor and I said, look, this city is gone unless we make it a safe city. But we have to close a budget gap of $2 billion in one month. I said, we have to do that. But unless we go out there, 
I make the city safe. Nobody's going to stay. Mm -hmm. Middle class is out of here. Businesses, they're out of here. I just left a guy with 6,000 people working for him. And he told me, all, you see this phone? That's all I need. He says, I could go to Switzerland tomorrow. Mm -hmm. He says, if my employees are not safe coming to work, and, they can, we're not, and I says, David, that's it. We've got to do this. And after much wrangling, David agreed with me to his great credit. Otherwise, we couldn't have done sure. it. And I created and molded and implemented what you now know as Safe Street, Safe City. And that was a big job. First, the mayor had to be, uh, be then we had to convince the legislature, mm -hmm. and you know how they feel about us, Absolutely. and we had to convince the governor. And we signed an agreement. That was a, the, another major, major um, accomplishment, because everyone said it couldn't be done. On top of which, the poor council members who were running again had to vote for a tax. Sure. Now, that's disaster. That's a, they, and they did it. What goodies did you give them to do it? No. Just, just, just the the issue itself was you know, compelling. You know, when you're, in a, when you're in a foxhole together, uh -huh. you know you're gonna you're gonna live or you're gonna die. Right. And they all came to the conclusion that they would rather live. They would rather live. This is good. And this is the only way everybody's gonna be able to live in the city. So that was a tremendous um, accomplishment. And and using that experience, I know I can do the same for schools. I can do the same for affordable housing. You know, when you earmark a pot of money and you use it for no other purpose, and hands off, we can do that kind of business. And, and you know, public education, I won't be satisfied, really, until public education is excellent and free. Free. Right from the moment you enter it to the time that you graduate. Because that's the way it was right. when you and I right. went to school. Right, exactly. Okay. These, these kids today are graduating owing more money than it costs for us to buy, buy a home. And well, that's an outrage. You put the kids through college. Yeah. You know. It's an know. outrage. Let's take an imaginary tour to the, through the five boroughs. Point out landmarks that you can point to and say, Peter Vallone did this. If it weren't for Peter Vallone, this building or facility or program wouldn't be there. Just take us on a little tour. Well, in almost every area, you know, you see new precincts in the city. I, I believe in neighborhood precincts, I believe in neighborhood policing, and I believe in neighborhood cops. And every time I see a cop on the street, I smile. I'll put a lot more on when I become. When I, I just traveled through a, 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 um, Williamsburg and Brooklyn mm -hmm. and Bensonhurst, where you see new homes being constructed mm -hmm. over the thing, because sure. you have Hasidic families that have 10 and 12 children. 10 and 12 children, which is, you know, the norm. Sure. So we had to change the zoning sure. in order to make it possible for them to, to, to be... I feel very good about that, and I feel very good about that kind of construction. Um, the parks, even though they're severely underfunded, severely underfunded, you'll see new playgrounds and you'll see new parks. We put that in. The council put that in. Uh, when you see the, um, the, uh, the Museum of Natural History, when you see uh, the, the beautiful dome there, you right. know, the, the, well, that was a council initiative. That was a council initiative. Every single cultural institution in the city has received council monies to make them where they are today. Every library is open six days a week. When I pass a library, I feel ecstatic. We opened okay. those libraries. Those every time I see a computer in a school, you thank the city council member that you elected. We put those computers in the school. That was a good tour. I love it. Let's but there's a lot more. I just left the Senior Citizen Center. These seniors are, are paying, choosing money for prescriptions over food. Mm. It's absurd that they have to pay so much money for, for a prescription coverage. I can do that. I, can, I have a plan that will, will relieve that kind of horror that a senior citizen is afraid to buy medications because he or she can't afford them. And I can do that too. And I, and I think it's, it's those that, that excitement of accomplishment plus what you, might, what you could do in the future. Mm -hmm. You had to see these senior citizens I just left. You, know, you love to see Oh, I love them because, because I, I like to undo the fear that certain people put in them, mm -hmm. that you're going to be dispossessed. Nobody's mm -hmm. going to be dispossessed from a rent, from a rent protected apartment, but you got these advocate lunatics running around that, you know, that people are going to throw you out. Then nobody's going to throw them out. So why, why are you, you know, scaring the life out of them? Mm -hmm. uh, so I think it, it's, a, it's a good soothing relationship. They trust me, and I, and I promise them I'm not going to let anything happen to them. Let's talk about endorsements. You've had a string of them, good string of them. Post, news, cranes, nice string. Do they matter? And if so, how so? And how much? Well, individual, like I've enjoyed Ed Koch's endorsement, and he's a great guy. He's, he was a mayor, so he, he knows how I, I uh, uh, operate in the city council. Uh, but the, the newspaper endorsements are far different 
because that's a, that's a consensus they had to reach among the editorial board. And all of them said the same thing, and, and I really love that. They're talking about integrity, talking about honor, they're talking about compassion, they're talking about trustworthiness. Whether you agree with me or not, there isn't anyone that can say I ever broke my word. Mm -hmm. And whether you agree with me or not, there isn't anyone that can say that I've ever closed the door to them. What so. do the endorsements get you? I mean, you're in a campaign, and campaigns result in votes, and the bottom line That's is what votes. What does it get you? Does it get you votes? Yeah, absolutely, because people who are not that familiar with government rely on people who have credibility. And an editorial page does have credibility with voters. Okay, so and it gives you, you some want. legitimacy. Yeah, it gives me legitimacy. And you know how close the presidential election was. Right, so people are now saying, hey, my vote counts. Well, I think this is even going to be closer. You okay. Know? So people now know my vote will make a difference. You know, and, and I think that's tremendous. We were talking off camera. Big, big endorsements still out there. You yeah. expect to rein and some of I, them in? I expect. Look, I'm looking for everybody's endorsement. Okay. And 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 there are some big endorsements that are still out there that will be coming in. What's what? What is big out there, irrespective of who it goes to? Who are the big I'm power endorsements? Get in, I'm not going to get. No, I mean, I mean, who's out there? I mean, well, the Times is out there. The Times out there. Newsdays is out there. The PBA is out there. You know, the what is 11.99 as we're very going to do anything? I don't know. I, I honestly don't know. But and I honestly don't know where these people are going to go. But I think I'll get my share okay. uh, of, of that. And I think the fact that I've, I've got the largest, you know, District Council sure. 37, which, and I've got the correction offices, and I have, these people work, the sanitation offices, you know, uh, I, I, the detectives, Endowment Association, the carpenters, I have a lot of people that, that make a difference. Why? Because they come out on Election Day. The New York City residents, they come out on Election Day, they bring their families and many of them are volunteers at the polls, which is, you know, very, very important. Okay. You've talked today and, 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 and other places about various plans to spend money on needed programs, whether it's education or seniors, etc. And there's been some discussion of, is there going to be enough money next fiscal year, two yeah. fiscal years down the line? Wall Street contracts, we've been riding the boom, we've got a contraction. What happens? Well, that's where, what happens? that's where credibility comes in. I've never said that I could fund anything that I couldn't fund. And, you know, everything, I mean, starting with whoever believed we could make the city safe, whoever believed we could put a billion dollars a year into into criminal justice system. I did that, okay? I'm talking about $400 million to cover every kid, every single kid in this city with full and adequate health insurance complete, across the board. And you've and, got the revenue stream. I got the revenue to do it. And every senior citizen to have affordable prescription and you've got the revenue I got the revenues to do it. And, and those revenues are going to be there. They're going to be there. They're going to be there. Now and just, you're guaranteeing Just it. think a minute. Go ahead. The power mayor has. Mayor Giuliani put $1,400,000,000 in the budget, out of the blue, to move Yankee Stadium from the Bronx to Manhattan. Don't stop me. Don't stop <laughs> that was me. We don't, we, we don't want to get into this. I one. took oh, that $1,400,000,000. I put it to schools. We reduced class size from the first to third grade. We got new textbooks for every kid. We replaced co old, old coal burners that were still in us. That's when the mayor made the mistake of putting that money in the budget. We jumped on it and, and, and put it into the schools. A mayor has extraordinary power to shave the budget and to put... And to put uh, his or her priorities into effect. So to a certain extent, your, your campaign is that you know the buck is, you know, as know well as the controller would I, know the buck. I think a little better than the controller. Okay. <laughs> a little better. TV characters and movie characters. What character is Rudy Giuliani? Um, General Patton, you know, I, I, he, he got the job done, uh, but only, move, only knew how to move forward, you know. Uh, and that's okay in time of war. <laughs> But the time of peace. Okay. Yeah. What about Peter Vallone? Uh, I get it's it's hard to it's hard to come up with a character to uh, illustrate what I want to do because I consider myself a character. I mean, I I okay. have, I, uh, I have uh, you know some people call me very conservative, some people call me very liberal. It's hard, but I think I'd be closer to Ed Koch. Okay. Ed Koch was uh, the kind of mayor who never lost a sense of humor, mm -hmm. who had nothing, but he held the city up high. Right. You know, and he had that confidence, and he picked commissioners that were all experts in the fields that he picked them, and he let them run the agency. You know, and, and I think I would be more along that style. Well, we'll count Ed Koch as a TV, or, and he's certainly a movie critic, if not a movie character. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Good luck. Thanks, sir. I, I enjoyed it. You don't have to like me. You don't have to be my friend. You may not like what I have to say. But hear me. Hear me. Hear me out. We're not all that different. We can end prejudice if we talk to each other. Paul. Tell us what you would do. Together we can build one America.
Mr. Green, welcome to CUNY TV. Thank you, Doug. Why you? Why Mayor Green? Why not Mayor Ferrer? Why not Mayor Hevesy? And why not Mayor Vallon? Why you? Um, I have three very qualified rivals with great experience. Doug, I think I have been a principled, consistent, outspoken Democrat when we needed one. So I've been consistently against the death penalty. I haven't waffled. Consistently, over seven years, spoken out against Mayor Giuliani when he tried to arrest the homeless, shut a museum, deny police misconduct. I've always tried to be a leader. Some candidates are brokers. They occupy their office. They split differences. Because I've spoken up and spoken out, I got rid of cigarette vending machines addicting our kids. Five years ago, I spoke out against police misconduct, sued the mayor, won, and I helped triple the rate of discipline in the NYPD. When women were being fired because they were merely domestic violence victims by bad companies, I wrote, pushed for two years, got the speaker and the council to finally enact my law, making it the first in the country comp companies couldn't fire domestic violence victims anymore. Example after example, I tried to show leadership and try to excel in the offices of public advocate and consumer affairs commissioner. Okay. Broker Peter Vallone, and in terms of your response, uh, flip flop Freddie Ferrer and leadership uh, Alan Hevesy. Doug, you are entitled to your brilliant okay. commentary okay. for which you don't get paid enough. Thank you. But Thank you. You asked about me. Okay. And, and I said, I why been, not them? Okay. And I have been outspoken okay. and consistent, and I think. Democrats have watched me over 11 years, not merely occupy an office, uh, but uh, be an aggressive, outspoken leader as consumer commissioner and public advocate. I have gotten so much done in offices that were small in size and authority. Think how much more I could do as mayor. What do you need as a great executive? Energy and urgency. I have both. Okay, let's, let's talk about that. Talk to me at a, about a defining political moment, a situation, an event, or an act that influenced the direction of your public life, an I mean, epiphany, if you will. In 1967, I was a 22-year-old, brown-haired, curly-haired, uh, pre-law intern in Washington working for Senator Jacob Javits. I thought the Vietnam War was illegal, immoral, and I was at risk. And so I organized 179 congressional interns to send a letter to President Johnson protesting the war. As a result, the House of Representatives ended, not the war, but the intern program. They abolished it for three years. And it was the first public act that I had done that President Johnson canceled his meeting to interns that summer. I'm just a kid out of Cornell going to Harvard Law School. I went... Troublemaker back then. I said, uh, uh, even then, I was the kind of activist that I have become now with a little better suits and a little more pay. That helped create what I was. I then became a public interest lawyer for 10 years, suing the Nixon administration, lobbying Congress on consumer and environmental issues. I think I've been a consistent, reform, outspoken Democrat, socially liberal on issues like choice, integration, gay rights. But when it comes to spending, I'm tight as a tick. I'm the consumer guy who saves people their money. I'm not okay. a big tax and spend liberal. And on criminal justice issues, I'm very bottom line oriented, which is why I'm proud that commissioners Bill Bratton and Pat Murphy and hero detective cop Steve McDonald have endorsed me and my crime plan. Okay. In addition to your the example you just gave, give us your biggest hands-on victory as a New York City political personality and figure. Well, you rolled up your sleeves, got your hands dirty, and got I'll, something I'll, done. I'll, I'll give you two examples. Again, showing leadership and results. When other Democrats were mute and scared about Mayor Giuliani, when he was usually popular in the mid-90s, especially on crime reduction, mm -hmm. and he gets his share of credit on crime reduction, I thought there was a level of racial profiling and harassment of communities of color. And so I sued the mayor to get the files of abusive, unpunished cops. He denounced me. Other Democrats were watching like spectators. Some were running for mayor. For over two years, I pursued the case. I won the case. I forced a disclosure sh documenting an NYPD that was great at crime reduction, but was protecting rather than punishing those mm -hmm. few officers who tainted the reputation and heroism of the rest. And I helped triple the rate of discipline along with working with the state attorney general, the federal attorney general. Second, Mayor Giuliani didn't like me because I spoke up. I don't mean just an election year.
but over the years when it counted. So he tried to take me out. I don't mean socially, I mean politically, and he tried to change the city constitution to stop this 170-year-long precedent that the office I hold is next in line of the mayor in terms of succession. Mm -hmm. Others said, you can't win this, he's the mayor. I organized a labor, business, civic, democratic coalition to stop him. We won at the polls. I beat Mayor Giuliani 76% to 24%. I, I, I. It's a terrible business. It, it, it prompts self-touting. But for my efforts on both those, we wouldn't have exposed the level of police misconduct we, we had, and we wouldn't have defeated Mayor Giuliani's charter proposals. Okay. Let's take a quick tour of the five boroughs and point out to me either programs or buildings or whatever that you can point to and say more green had an effect. If, if it weren't for more green and what he's done, this wouldn't be there. Now, when you're uh, a city planner or a borough president, you could say, I got money for this building. I'm a citywide official. Right. What I can do is you can go to any movie theater. And 10 years ago, they were selling cigarettes and 13-year-olds were getting addicted for life because of this habit. I got rid of, it's not that I had a building, it's that I took something out okay. of a building. Fair enough. Um, and uh, uh, second, um, people who now run for office all over the city, in the old days, the richer you were, the bigger your old boys network, the more likely you'd win. Today, there are hundreds of people running on a level playing field because four years ago, I pushed and got Speaker Peter Vallone, my friend, to sp sponsor my bill to uh, reduce the top contribution you could make, have more matching funds, so Go ahead. average people could run for office. The four to one public match in the campaign finance reform law was my idea. I'm glad to give Peter Vallone the credit because as the speaker, he's the traffic cop getting credit for the cars that drive by. So you're, when, you, when we're taking this tour, you're looking at the candidates who are out there competing for city council and others and saying, I, look, I, helped, I helped do that. I opened up not a building, but a government. Okay. And for 30 years, from my book, Who Runs Congress, exposing the, how money controls Congress, to my proposal and enactment of the Vallone Green Campaign Finance Law, I've changed the face of government in the city, okay. which can change the face of the city. That's fine. Has anything happened in this campaign that you never expected? Surprise, shock. Not really. My wife will tell you that a year ago I visualized a campaign where I thought I was starting out in a very strong position. Not because I have a famous last name. I don't. Or a lot of more money than anybody else. I don't. I had a record and an energy in terms of getting things done, in terms of going to every neighborhood. I've had a town meeting in every single neighborhood that would lead voters to, to favor me. Nothing has changed that original perception. Okay. What about the campaign as a whole? Is, are there any surprises, not necessarily of your role and what you've done and where you are, but the campaign in general? Is, is there something shocking about it? You're, you're asking me to be a pundit, which I rarely do. Uh, that's why you're better at I, you're, you are better than I am at that, and I hope I'm a better mayor than you would be. This is why we each do what we do. I will now give in and give one example. Okay, thank you. Everything has gone according to Hoyle and plan. I feel like I'm in a strong position because I worked hard, I got things done, and Democrats know my results. The one thing that obviously is surprising is that uh, Alan Hevesy, a competent, experienced man, for years would embrace Mayor Giuliani's proposals and never, ever criticize him with one or two exceptions. And suddenly he's ending his candidacy, calling the mayor a liar, and bitterly, personally, and repeatedly attacking him. That's a 180. Whether it's smart or stupid, justified or not, mm -hmm. I'll let other people decide. It's unarguable that over the years when I would stand with the mayor on ending the Board of Ed, mm -hmm. but I would often stand up against him, and everybody knows that. I now am trying to look beyond him, because Mayor Giuliani's not on the ballot. Mm -hmm. so I am focusing relentlessly on what better ideas do I have to make this a safer, smarter city by 2010. Okay. I've been consistent in that in the year of the election. And the controller has gone from friend to foe of Mayor Giuliani, and uh, we'll see if that's a good strategy. Okay, let's talk about endorsements. Do they matter? How so and how much? Can endorsement move enough votes to make a difference? It's a very good question. 
From the beginning, I believe that endorsements are like allow the Jewish vernacular, chicken soup. They can't hoit. Why not? But my goal was to persuade voters that I was a strong visionary leader, and then the elites would follow. Other candidates try to get the endorsements, and then the voters would follow. I believe my view has prevailed. I am very proud to have gotten the support of former Mayor David Dinkins, former Police Commissioner uh, Bill Bratton, uh, the highest elected official in Brooklyn, Howard Golden, the borough uh, president, Fernando Mateo, great Dominican and the livery cab and entrepreneurial leader uh, in our city, and so many others I can't even begin to list what them. Did, what did they give you? But uh, what it is, it's they legitimize a candidate to people who don't otherwise know the candidate. Mm -hmm. So they can be decisive in a race for city council where voters don't know uh, Jim, Jane, or Joe. Mm -hmm. They are rarely decisive in a presidential or a mayoral contest because voters know so much about the presidential nominees or the finalists for mayor. Voters make up their own minds and endorsements have some uh, leverage at the margin, but I, I haven't thought they're decisive even though I've tried for them and I'm proud. As we speak, I've gotten 25 labor unions, 330,000 members, and the most labor support of any candidate, like Unite, and the, all the uh, doormen, 30, SEIU 32BJ. I won the endorsement of the Working Families Party. That's a ballot mm -hmm. line. And they know better who's for working families than them. And the ACORN organization, the best grassroots group in the city. Now, all the groups I just named are 90% black, Latino, Asian. I happen not to be any of those three. Mm -hmm. I have the broadest interracial coalition based on voters and endorsements, which is essential to govern the city after Giuliani. There are two left on the table, big ones, Times, 1199, then Newsday as well. Can they move it? Can they put you, for example, over 40? Can they move one of the other three into a runoff? Can Sabe. Uh, Doug, by the time this is aired, the New York Times may have endorsed. Uh, the largest union in the city, Dennis Rivera's 1199, may have endorsed. Am I hopeful? Are you Absolutely hopeful? hopeful. I got to this chair by, by the ethic that no one is smart enough to be a pessimist. I'm certainly not. I am a wild eyed optimist. Okay. And okay. Uh, so far, very good. Okay. Last question TV and movie characters. Who's Rudy Giuliani? Uh, he's seen too many Arnold Schwarzenegger, Elliot Ness movies. He's a cross. What about Mark Green? Uh, the tennis playing uh, Bill Cosby in I Spy. Ooh, good one. <laughs> I love Bill. I love tennis. Um, I'm not as furtive as he was. Um, uh, my wife wishes I were John Lindsay or Bob Redford, but she made the choice 24 years ago, and here I am. And with that, we'll close. Thank you very Thank much. You, it was a pleasure. I enjoyed it. Thank you. If you took away a star for every one million people who didn't vote, and a stripe for every five million non-voters, and a patch of blue for the ten million people who didn't care, exactly what kind of flag are we waving? Hello, Mr. Ferrer. Welcome to CUNY TV. Professor Muzio, glad to be with you. Why you? Why Mayor Ferrer and not Mayor Mark Green, Mayor Alan Hevesy, or Mayor Peter Vallone? Well, it's not only the issues that we bring to this campaign. Look, I'm talking about bold initiatives in affordable housing, improving teaching and learning, after-school programs, access to health care, and improving the relationship between police and community with aggressive community policing, with uh, proactive community policing, uh, accountability that is clear and credible and transparent and a legislated end to racial profiling. But beyond that, when I talk about these issues, affordable housing that's decent. Look, I lived in a five-story walk-up that didn't have heat and hot water in the wintertime. I know what that's about. Were it not for the power of a great education, you'd be interviewing somebody else right mm -hmm. now, not me. An after-school program, the PAL on Kelly Street, two blocks away from my house, 
helped me survive the tough street I was brought up on. So I take these issues personally as well. So the why not is they haven't walked the walk and lived the life and you have. Well, it's up to and including uh, participating in an act of civil disobedience and submitting myself to voluntary arrest in the mm -hmm. Diallo protest mm -hmm. because I believed that the management of the police department needed positive reform. Mm -hmm. uh, it turns out I was the only um, high-ranking city official to have done so. But I believed it then. I believe it today. Okay. Tell us about a defining political moment, a situation, an event, or an act that's affected the direction of your public life. My first weekend as borough president, I took my then young daughter to see where her daddy played stickball on Fox Street between Prospect Avenue and Avenue St. John. And I was telling her about the five and six-story walk-up buildings, the delicatessen, the candy store, the grocery store I worked in when I was 12, the corner I shined shoes on. And all she could see was grass growing as high as my hip from Fox Street, mm -hmm. Beck Street, Kelly mm -hmm. Street. I remember. That was gone. Um, that told me not only that I had to rebuild the Bronx, but also who I was rebuilding it for, for those kids. For them to have a childhood, maybe a little easier than I had, but in a decent place where there was a decent park, where there's a good school, uh, where there was some hope and opportunity. That's what made all the difference for me. Um, that really did make all the difference in my public service. That visit mm -hmm. with my daughter to just put everything into clear focus. Okay, let's continue along that vein. What's your biggest hands-on victory where you rolled up your sleeves, got your hands dirty, and got something done? You did it. Well, I don't think I did anything uh, unilaterally or individually. Okay. I mean, I'm a team player. Okay. I like to involve communities, involve people on the ground. But I think the biggest thing where I and so many others rolled up their sleeves was building affordable housing in the Bronx, taking a desolate urban landscape, taking those pictures of window shades and flower pots and shutters out of the window openings, tearing them down, putting up real windows, real window shades, real flower pots, and above all, real families living on the inside. So much so that in 14 years, we've created nearly 67,000 homes and apartments for people who low and moderate income who are now living more decent better mm -hmm. lives with themselves and their families. Okay. Let's take a tour of the five boroughs. I know you can take me a tour, on a tour of the Bronx and point out that this is here because of Freddie Ferrer. Take us on a tour of other boroughs. What is there, either physical structures or programs, that might not be there if not for the involvement of Freddie Ferrer? Just point out some of the landmarks, if you will. Well, on City Island, uh, it's a great restaurant community and seafaring maritime community uh, at the northern and eastern tip of the Bronx, connected to the Bronx mainland by a bridge. So you're not counting that as the Bronx. Okay, go it ahead. is the go Bronx. Ahead. Go ahead. But they used to have this uh, closet-sized library that was the most overutilized in the city. I got together with the local councilman at the time, Mike DeMarco, put the money together mm -hmm. and built them a library that serves their kids well, as well as after-school programs over there because and little league programs because those kids on city island they get into trouble too mm -hmm. and that's the problem you got to give them after school and weekend alternatives um, or the kingsbridge little league uh, they needed a not only replacement field but they needed lights to be able to play in the evening why play in the evening you might ask i want to keep these kids off the well, street i understand or the pal now, I played in the Lynch PAL Center on Kelly Street, but that was falling apart even when I was a kid. Well, we got together with PAL and I paid half, $4 million, to build a new building for the PAL, an even better building, a bigger building on Longwood Avenue. So another generation of kids will have the same or better chance I did to stay off the streets. Okay. Let's look at the campaign. Anything happen that really surprised you or shocked you? I mean, you're an experienced campaigner. You've run borough-wide campaigns and you've run council campaigns. Anything out of the ordinary here shocked Freddie Fourier? 
I think it's fair to say nothing in this campaign has gone the way it was anticipated. Oh, okay. I mean, absolutely nothing. Um, but that's part of the adventure of running in New York. I what's, mean, look, the, what's the biggest thing you didn't expect? Biggest thing I didn't expect? Uh, oh, those terrible charges about bribery in the papers. I mean, I've known Alan Hevesy a long time. Look, we'll disagree on issues. Mm -hmm. uh, but, I mean, come on, uh, to do that, to smear a guy's... Uh, hard-earned reputation. You know, when you're in public service, the only thing you own free and clear is your good name. Sure. Um, I, I just think that's repellent. What about the role of strategy versus just luck? I mean, you said everything that could have happened did happen. How much, do, how much does the candidate really control his or her destiny? What do you feel like every day in terms of going out into the world? If the old saying I'd rather be lucky than smart is true, and I think to a large extent it is, Okay. then uh, I'd rather be lucky. Uh, but look, uh, if my strategy is simple, and that is trying to touch as many New Yorkers as possible, tell them the things I believe in. Now, when I decided to announce formally my campaign for mayor, I did it on the street where I played stickball, mm -hmm. across from where I uh, lived in 588 Fox Street. I wanted New Yorkers to know who I was what I believed in and how I came by those beliefs. Uh, and if the strategy is as simple as letting people know who you are, what you believe in, the problems you see looming over the city and the solutions you propose, well then, let the better agenda for the city's future win. Okay. Let's talk about endorsements. Uh, all the, it seems like all the biggies are in. The only one, we're talking about the two, we were at the Tuesday before the election. Mm -hmm. The only Trump card out there, I guess, is 1199, and it doesn't seem like they're going to do anything. Well, look, I just picked up the endorsement uh, a little while ago of the Transport Workers Union, Mike Quill and Roger Toussaint's union. Uh, so I'm really proud of that. And look, uh, there's an awful lot of time for uh, people to weigh in. The last week is really the ninth inning of this bowl game. So let's see what happens. Do they matter? Do endorsements matter? How much do they matter and why? Why do you want all these endorsements? What do they give you? Well, look, uh, endorsements are important. Uh, they let other people know what people think of you. Um, and the extent to which people associate with an institution or an individual, uh, that helps. It really does. But at the end of the day, what's going to really make a difference is what you believe. And it all comes down to this. When a voter walks into the booth, pulls the curtain closed, they've got to come to grips with the, their vision of the future of this city, who they believe is best equipped to carry that vision forward. Uh, so endorsements are terrific. Polls I take in stride, um, everything else. But my strategy is very simple, to work as hard as I can to bring my message of hope and opportunity to every voter I can. Let's talk about Al Sharpton, mm -hmm. since everybody else is talking about him. Why uh, should yes, you be different? Why should I be different? The parade yesterday, the Caribbean parade, <clears throat> he's popular. Can he deliver votes? What does is, what is Al Sharpton in particular bring to Freddie Ferrer? Reverend Al Sharpton speaks for a great many New Yorkers who have been dispossessed, especially in the last eight years. Uh, but even more than that, uh, when he endorsed me, he associated himself completely with my message of affordable housing, improvements in teaching and learning, not blowing up the Board of Education, that silly stuff that won't improve a child's reading or math scores by even one percentage point. After school programs to keep our kids out of harm's way and give them a better education. Accessible, regular health care for people. Not only the 25% of New Yorkers who don't have health insurance, but those New Yorkers who are one pink slip away from losing their own health insurance. And Al Sharpton, and I was one of those who participated with him, helped to reshape the debate on policing in mm -hmm. this city so that we will have a police department that inspires the trust and confidence and support and respect of every New Yorker when we legislate, instead of talk about ending racial profiling, legislate an end to it. Have clear and credible police accountability and have community policing initiatives so that every neighborhood knows their cop and every cop knows their neighborhood. Is it any coincidence that after Al Sharpton endorses you, polls, the WABC poll and today's Quinnipiac poll shows Freddie Ferrer in a dead heat with Mark Green picking up black votes, looks like from Green and really solidifying his Latino base? 
Well, Doug, look, uh, I take every poll in stride, as I told you. I take the good ones in stride. I take the bad ones in stride. But you had a couple of good ones. Well, uh, it's always better to have a couple of good ones than a couple of bad ones. But I take them all in stride because what matters to me most is how people are responding to my message. And I have the support of Reverend Al Sharpton and former Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan, mm -hmm. Congressman Charlie Rangel, and former Congresswoman Geraldine Ferraro, uh, Congresswoman Nydia Velasquez and Congressman Jose Serrano and Assemblyman Ivan Lafayette and Assemblywoman Kathy Nolan. Those mean something. Okay, to me. let me ask a question that's been bugging me personally. You're in single digits with white voters or low double digits. Why? You're a moderate, centrist Democrat, Catholic. Why not more white voters? I would have expected more white voters for Friday. You know, again, Doug, I'm not a pollster, but when I talk about people's need to live in decent and affordable housing, Polish community in Greenpoint has that same need. I the understand. The Jewish community in Williamsburg has that same need. I, the Irish in Inwood and on the north shore of Staten Island have that same need. And all I can do, Doug, is to tell them what I believe okay. in. That's fair, because clearly in your rhetoric, you've been inclusive, and it just doesn't seem to have resonated. Is this sort of two cities analysis, even though you may not use the, the terms per se, turned off white voters because they misunderstand the message? They're not listening to the message? All I can tell you again is, Doug, when I did a train stop on the west side of Manhattan, very well-dressed in a pinstripe, charcoal gray pinstripe business suit, white gentleman tells me, thank you for speaking about the other New York. I'm having a tough time paying my own rent. Fair enough. And that's the point. Fair enough. Okay, last question. Rudy Giuliani, TV and movie character, who is he most like? <laughs> that's the reaction we've gotten. But, I mean, come on. This is um, your shot. Do you remember um, uh, that song, A Boy Named Sue? Sure. Well, uh, this is a guy, mayor named Rudy, who seems uh, that he's... Uh, uh, because of what or who he is or who he thinks he is, has to pick a fight with just about everybody in this city. Um, now, I don't understand it. It didn't have to be that way, uh, but it is. So I don't hold that the policies of the last eight years need to set the table for the next four. In fact, mm -hmm. I think those policies have divided New York. And only a bridge built on hope and opportunity will bring those two New Yorks back together again. What TV or movie character is Freddie Ferrer? Oh, gosh. I don't know. I'd like to say Robert Redford, but uh, I don't. <laughs> we'll take uh, it. But, but uh, I know that's not true. I look in the mirror and shave every day. Okay. Thank you very much. It was a real pleasure. Good Thank luck. Thank you, Doug.